Right, so, I oed fa dydd gwener y groglith, a dyn ni'n ymuno efo eglwys efyn yn oedd Aber Ystwyth, a ni yw Alfred Place Baptist Church fi yw Rhodri, a Rhodri Brady, un o'r uh, arweinwyr o Alfred Place Baptist Church. Welcome to this Good Friday service. Um, we are joining together with the, uh, what we call the, the Welsh Church, uh, it's a Welsh language church in Aberystwyth, Eglwys Avingalaidd Aberystwyth. Um, and my name is Rhodri. I'm one of the leaders at Alfred Place. I'm speaking from my study um, in the Alfred Place Mance, uh, something which I'm very sad to be doing, especially on today of all days. Uh, this is one of the highlights of our year, meeting together um, on Good Friday. And uh, we're especially missing seeing your faces uh, those of you who are from the Welsh Church, we, we love meeting together with you on Good Friday and on Christmas Day and at different prayer meetings that we have together uh, and uh, informally as well. Uh, we we love you and uh, we're really sad that we can't see you. Uh, we can't see each other uh, face to face. But nevertheless, we have this technology uh, at some of our fingertips and so we want to make the most of, of what the means that the Lord has given us uh, to communicate with one another. And so, um, welcome. If you're unfamiliar with either of our churches, um, you can find out more about us on our websites. Uh, there are contact details there so that you can get in touch with us. Uh, the only th other thing I wanted to say was that, that if you're an English speaker, then we have a, a similar meeting to this on Easter Sunday. Uh, will be streaming uh, or the, the, the YouTube video will go up at least it will be pre-recorded but the video will go up at 11 a.m. on Easter Sunday and 5 p.m. and that will be on YouTube but you can access those links through the website uh, and uh, if you're on the email list be there glo seven a life and mind mass are the seal of pask our Facebook live um, ma Oed fawn nhw am hanner ar wedi deg yn y bore a pimp o'r gloch uh, yn, y, yn y nos, uh, yn y prynhawn. Let me start this service by reading God's word to you. Beth am ni ddechrau gan darllen gair dyw gyda ein gilydd. Gan fod gennym felly ar chofeiriad mawr sydd wedi mynd drwy'r nefoedd, sef Iesu, mab dyw, gadewch i ni lynu wrth ein cyffes. Can I snit Archofeliad Heb Athli Kid the Othev? And when did I see Genim? And in seed wedi a demptio, a whore peth, and a rein moth, an e. A keto heb bechod. Vesli Gadelchini Nesai moan hudder at orseth grass. El moan derbin, trigareth a chile grass and gumorth. An a breed, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Well, the first thing we're going to do in terms of uh, singing is uh, through a video that uh, Chris Eilif has put together for us. It's the hymn, I Stand Amazed in the Presence of Jesus the Nazarene. The recording is from the EMW Aberystwyth Conference and uh, the words uh, are going to be put over the video for us. And so let's sing together. We're separate, but let's sing together.
us pray. Almighty God, uh, we pray that you would be gracious to us, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners, and for whom he was willing to suffer death upon the cross. Adioch, o dad, bod yesi wedi cymryd ein saloch ni arnoi hyn, bod e wedi dioddau ein poenau ni yn lle ni, bod yr arglwydd yesi wedi cael ei gosbi i wneud pethau'n iawn i ni, a bod e wedi cael ei giro fel bod ni'n gallu cael ein iachau. Thank you, Father, that he was pierced for our transgressions. Thank you, Father, that he was crushed for our iniquities. Thank you, Father, that the punishment that has brought us peace was on him, that by his wounds we are healed. We confess that we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. May it be that you, Lord, have laid on him the iniquity of every single person watching this video this morning. Felly, dyn eisiau rhoi bendeth i ti ein arglwydd dyw o hen ymlaen ac i dragu ddoldeb. We want to give all the praise to you, Lord, from everlasting to everlasting. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. My reading comes from John's Gospel, chapter 19, from the end of verse 16 up to verse 24. I'll read it first in Welsh and then in English. Hanes Chrysoiliad Iesi Grist. Ioan yn dignaw, diwedd adnod yn dechwech. Felly, cymer asad Iesi, a gaeth allan gan gario ei groes ei hun, i'r man a elwyr lle penglog. Yn i aeth yr i ddewon fe gelwyr Golgotha. Yna, croesoel i asad ef, a dai arall gydag ef, un ar bob ochr, a Iesi yn y canol. Ysgrifennodd Pilat deitl a'i osod ar y groes. Dyma'r hyn a ysgrifennwyd. Iesi o Nazareth bryn i'n yr Iddewon. Darllennodd llawer o'r Iddewon y teitl hwn. Oherwydd o'r y fan lle croes hoeliwyd Iesi yn agos i'r ddinas. Yr oedd y teitl wedi ei sgrifennu yn iaith yr Iddewon ac mewn Lladin a Groeg. Yna, mae ddau prif o ffeiriad yr Iddewon wrth Pailet paid ag ysgrifennu brenin yr Iddewon, ond yn hydrach, dywedodd ef brenin yr Iddewon wy fi. A tebodd Pailet, yr hyn a ysgrifennais a ysgrifennais. Wedi ddim goesolio Iesu, cymerodd y milwyr a'i ddillad ef a'i rhannu'n bedau rhan, un i bob milwr. Cymer a sant a'i gris hefyd, roedd hwn yn ddiwiniad wedi ei wai o'r pen yn un darn. Peidiwn a'i rhwygo hi, meddai milwyr wrth ei gilydd, gadewch yn i fwrw coelbren amdani i benderfynu pwy gaiff i. Felly, cyflawnwyd yr ysgrythu'r sy'n dweud, rhanasant fy nillad yn ei misg a bwrw coelbren ar fy ngwysg. Felly y gwnaeth y milwyr. I'll read the same section in English. It's John's Gospel, chapter 19, beginning just at, just at the end of verse 16. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, 
and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my garments among them, and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. May God help us to understand his word. I want to do this morning uh, from this very short section that Derek read to us, John 19, 70 to 24, Johan Indig Now, Indig Scythe, Dialic Pedwar. Um, what I want to do is, is pick out three striking things uh, from this account, uh, which is very familiar to most of us, about Jesus' crucifixion. It's probably the strangest and perhaps the saddest or most fright, uh, frightening Good Friday that you, you've ever had. And it would be easy in the midst of all this sadness and strangeness and, and anxiety that's going on in, in everyone's minds right now to forget the most important thing, why Good Friday is called Good Friday. Good Friday is called Good Friday because... It's, a, it's not just a good day, but a, but a holy day. Um, it's a special day, a day on which we must think, especially, especially deeply about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a day that's set apart for that purpose. This is the day on which the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. So like I said, with those things in mind, I do want to look at three things, just three things from the, the crucifixion narrative in John's Gospel. And the first thing I want to say uh, has this image of the Lord Jesus carrying his own cross as its starting point. So here's point one. Take in this striking contrast between life and death. Edrechoch ar a cover bunyad trau yadol ama from boed a marwalith. Throughout the Bible, we see that our God is the living God. Moses, speaking on behalf of the Israelites, relates his experience of meeting God when he says, Who is there of all flesh who has heard the voice of the living God? speaking from the midst of the fire as we have and survived. What he's saying there is that it's a truly marvellous thing to engage with the living God. And it's a title that's used of God again and again in the Old Testament. And again and again in the Old Testament, we, we get these encounters with the living God. We've had that one that we just mentioned there for the Lord speaking from the fire to the people of Israel in the desert. Um, but we see some walking with him and talking with him and encountering him face to face. And what you see if you read the Old Testament, therefore, is that there is a person in the Godhead a person who is God, but is separate from God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, who are also God. Uh, God come down. We know him as the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so what we're saying then is that Jesus is the living God. And so when we get to the Gospels, we're reminded that that Jesus really, really is the living God. Peter confesses it when he says that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And we see it in places like 1 Timothy 4, where Paul says uh, that we should hope in the living God. They're referring to God the Son. And yet there is a juxtaposition here. On the one hand, we have been presented in the Bible whenever we, we meet Christ with life, life, life. Nothing but life in this one that is the living God. And yet look at him. Look at him in verse 17. Here he is carrying his own cross, this instrument of death that anyone who who died on, and that, that's what those who, who were crucified had to go through. They had to carry their instrument of death. Perhaps a more modern equivalent would be a noose which you were charged to tie up onto the gallows or an electric chair that you were charged with charging or a lethal injection and that you had to get the poison into the needle. Only people who deserve death, who in a sense embody death, should have to go through such an experience. And so it's striking from the very beginning of this passage to see not someone who embodies death, someone who deserves death, but the living God being weighed down by this instrument of death. We're taking in this striking contrast between life and death. The Ninedrich are a cover bunyad, rong boed, a marwalaith. But also look at where he's walking to. Verse 17 again, the, the place of the skull. Now, whether it's called the place of the skull because it looks like a skull or because it's a place of, of death, a place where, where many have died before, I don't know, perhaps both. Either way, it's clearly a place of death if it is called the place of the skull. And it ramps up the contrast even higher. The Lord Jesus Christ, the living God, walking to the place of death, the place of the skull. And then look at verse 18. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. That only serves to heighten the incongruity that was a word my English teacher used to say was one of his favourite words, uh, incongruous, incongruous. It's a word that you use when stuff doesn't match up, when, when things don't agree. And it's the right word to use for this situation. Jesus, in between two thieves? The Lord Jesus, with all his vitality and, and goodness, here, under the weight of the cross, the cross that he will soon be nailed to, walking to a place that oozes death, where he will be killed alongside two criminals. It's incongruous. We're here in this first point, seeking to take in this striking contrast between life and death. A cover bunyad, trawiadol, from boed, a marwalaith. There are lots of examples from history when a, a state of emergency is declared and a country is put under martial law. It, it has worthy roots in Roman legend. The idea is that the state is in crisis and extraordinary leadership is needed. I've mentioned to those in Alpha Place uh, before uh, about Cincinnatus, who, as legend has it, came into power in Rome to discharge a crisis and then went back to his farm. A seemingly perfect response to desperate times calling for desperate measures. But often when other countries have this policy inspired, 
by the desperate times call for desperate measures principle, they use the power to their own advantage and not to help others. Perhaps the most striking example is one I read about recently from the Philippines, where President Ferdinand Marcos in 1972, for almost 10 years, declared one of these states of emergency, martial law. The worrying thing about that was that it involved him dissolving the press. Free speech was quashed. He was given a license to pump out propaganda about himself and even arrested his political opponents. Things don't tend to end well when desperate times call for desperate measures. But what does it look like for God when desperate times call for desperate measures? You'll be aware that the desperate time we're in is one that we're feeling quite keenly at the moment, a time in which our own fallenness in this world is not difficult to feel. But things have not been bad just since the coronavirus came along. From almost the very beginning of our existence as humans, we've been rebelling against God again and again. God has showed us that that has consequences. We rebel against him. And despite much, much patience shown towards us, he does show us that there are consequences to our sins. This is why we die. This is why hell exists. This is why death hangs over all of our lives. But despite all that being true, God also says, well, what if there was a way to save you from all this, to, to rescue you? To which every sane person says, well, yes, please, anything. Save us from ourselves and the judgment we've incurred. To which God says, well, it's going to be very costly. To which you might say, well, fine, we'll, we'll pay whatever's required. Um, perhaps an arrangement could be made where we pay in good deeds God back for all the bad deeds. We make sacrifices, we show devotion. We even go through suffering if that's what's required. To which God says, no, no. When I said that this desperate measure was going to be very costly, I meant that it was going to be very costly for me. The weight of this yoke around your neck, I'll carry it, Jesus says. Now, what does that look like? How much does it cost us? How much does it cost God to get us back to him? That really is the key question of the Bible. The only way for those who deserve death to receive life is for the one who is the Lord to receive death. The only way for those who deserve death to receive life is for the one who is the Lord of life to receive death. Do you believe that? Is that what you see here? Do you look into these crucifixion stories and see hope? Or do you just go through the motions of Easter? That was the first thing. Take in this striking contrast between life and death. A drachoch ar y cyferbyniad trawiadol yma rhwng bywyd a marwolaeth. But now I want us to look at two more striking things from this passage. Uh, here's what we're going to say for point two. Note that the truth-suppressing pilot in a truth-suppressing culture is nevertheless used by God to promote the truth. It's another point about contrast. Note that the truth-suppressing pilot in a truth-suppressing culture is nevertheless used by God to promote the truth. Salwch fod y rhei oedd yn cysau y gwirionedd yn cael ei ddefnyddio gan dyw i hyrwyddo y gwirionedd. Salwch fod y rhei oedd yn cysau y gwirionedd yn cael ei ddefnyddio gan dyw i hyrwyddo'r gwirionedd. Look at verse 19. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross 
It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. There's something driving Pilate to want to broadcast to everyone that Jesus is the King of the Jews. Look at verse 20. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. And then there's the exchange in verses 21 and 22, where in verse 22, the chief priests and uh, the chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. And Pilate replies with these famous words, what I have written, I have written. What's the motivation here? It can't be that, that Pilate really believed that Jesus was the king. He just sentenced him to death. No, I think this is Pilate giving a signal to the world about what happens when Jews try to, to rise up. It's a political move from Pilate. You can picture him in the Roman court saying, yeah, well, there was this bloke. He claimed to be king. I had him crucified and, and put a sign up in, in all, all the common languages uh, saying, this is the king of the Jews. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> this dead guy. That's what happens to people who say that they're, they're the king of the Jews. They're any kind of king. In other words, Pilate was saying, don't get any ideas. We Romans are in charge here, not you Jews. But with full acknowledgement of Pilate's intentions, it's a very apt moment, is it not? This is broadcast to, to the world. Nowadays, perhaps it would be written in, in English, Spanish and Chinese, so that as many people as possible could understand what it said. Pilate writes this sign in the three major languages of the time, the local language, the, the political language and the cultural language, Aramaic, Latin and Greek. But little does Pilate know that he is an instrument of publicity for God himself. We're noting that the truth-suppressing Pilate in a truth-suppressing culture is nevertheless used by God to promote the truth. My rey oedd yn cysau a gwirionedd yn cael ei ddefnyddio gan ddew i hyrwyddo'r gwirionedd. My favourite example of this taking place in our own day is a story I heard from a pastor and writer I know uh, lots of you know uh, called Paul Mallard. Uh, he tells a story of a chapel building in Wiltshire, uh, which you can see as soon as you get into the station. And the most striking thing about this chapel building is that on the roof of the chapel, in big white letters, uh, is painted a big text. I, I think it says something like, What think ye of Christ? or something to that effect. Anyway, there were, there were lots of secular people uh, in the village who really thought that this was distasteful uh, and not the first thing that people should see when they arrived in this quaint place. Uh, and so they wrote to the council and asked for it to, to be removed, for the, the, the painted gospel text to be removed from the roof. It's an eyesore, they were saying. And the council replied, thank you for your letter uh, we'll investigate this and get it sorted. So the council set up an inquiry into this church building and the big white text on the side of the roof. In the course of the research, they concluded that really this was a unique feature on an excellently preserved church building and that therefore it should become listed so that no one could tamper with it. That's a classic example of what the law does. Sure, pe people like Pilate think that they're in charge, but God even uses their, their sinful efforts in order to promote his kingdom. Can you see then that, that God is calling the shots here? He's in charge. Elsewhere, we read of Pilate shrugging his shoulders and saying, well, what is truth? And yet God manages to get him to make an international 
gospel poster full of truth. Jesus is the king. And the religious leaders uh, are desperate to suppress the truth too. But again, see how God so easily steamrolls their requests. You, you don't like what's written about the king? Well, there's nothing you can do about it. The sign says he is the king. That's because he is the king. But can you see this Pilate-like, Pharisee-like tendency to suppress the truth in yourself? Do you ever turn a blind eye to truths found in God's word? Whenever we find ourselves ignoring the truth about who Jesus is and instead dwelling on other comparatively irrelevant details, we make this mistake. Anything within our thinking, even theological thinking, which diminishes Christ, means that we are falling into this trap. This is something we should be aware of. But may this also be an encouragement to you if, if you do wish to promote Christ and to worship Christ and, and to live for Christ. No matter how much our culture seeks to suppress the truth, no matter how much the big players on the world stage may seek to suppress the truth, they not only will be unsuccessful, but they will be used to promote the truth. And that was point two. The, the truth-suppressing pilot in a truth-suppressing culture is nevertheless used by God to promote the truth. Mae'r rhei oedd yn cysair gwirioneth yn cael ei ddefnyddio gan ddiw i hyrwyddo'r gwirioneth. But following on from that theme, there's one more thing I'd like to say, and it does have to do with contrast again. We've seen the contrast between life and death and truth and lies, but we need to think about the relationship between darkness and light Here's the third and final point. Remember, there is much darkness here, but the light overrules. Cofiwch mae'r tywallwch yn gryf ond y golau sy'n ennill. Mae'r tywallwch yn gryf ond y golau sy'n ennill. There's real, there's a real emphasis in John's Gospel on how much darkness seems to be taking over. Yet at the same time, we're reassured by John's narrative that this all comes under the reign of the God of light, who is still on the throne. This is seen most clearly in the events of verses 23 and 24. We read there that when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Can you see both the darkness but also the overall rule of the light? Here, yes, there's this painfully awful, cruel scene of these yobs taking Jesus' clothes. And yet we're reminded not only that, that this is under God's providence, as every event is, but this has been prophesied in Holy Scripture. God, the Holy Spirit, inspired David to prophesy that this awful thing would happen to the Lord Jesus to cement this idea that the way to salvation had to be via humiliation. And yet, the darkness does not win. The light always defeats the darkness. There's a bit in the Lord of the Rings books I've heard quoted that, that talks about what it looks like for some people to go through their darkest hour. Frodo and Sam are, are, are in their darkest hour. And here's what he says. He says, You and I, Sam, are still stuck in the worst places of the story. 
and it is all too likely that Sam will say, at this point, shut the book, Dad. We don't want to read any more. But of course, as you know the story, if you know the story, uh, the darkness does not prevail. As G.K. Chesterton puts it, the best stories don't just tell us that dragons exist, they tell us that dragons can be beaten. This has got to be your perspective in these dark times. Uh, these dark times that we're living through right now. Today, perhaps more than ever, it is not difficult to see that there is much darkness. But we must remember that the light overrules. And so all that's left is for me to ask you, what does the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus mean to you? With my croes hoiliad ar argloed iesu grist yn gylygu i chi. We are born on the side of darkness. A bit like those two soldiers in the comedy sketch who have skulls on their hats, who ask one another, do you think we're the baddies in this story? Well, in the story of the world, we're the baddies. We're born on the side of darkness rather than light. And God rightly vows to cast anyone who remains in darkness into eternal darkness. But the Lord Jesus died on the cross to defeat darkness. And if you trust in him and not in yourself, then you can be brought from darkness into light. As we're told in the book of Isaiah, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Has the light shone on you? Perhaps there where you are in, in your living room or in your kitchen or in your bedroom or wherever you might be, you think it's the least likely place and you think that you're in the the least likely place spiritually to be able to receive light and life and hope and yet the Lord Jesus he is the light he is life he's the living God and he is able to bring you out of darkness and into light yes you behaved as one who lives in the darkness you've done unspeakable deeds that it's shameful to even talk about. And yet, the Lord Jesus can transform you. He can forgive you your sins and start to make you like his son, the Lord of light. Well, these are the things uh, for us to be thinking about today and over this weekend. And there are things that we can think about as we sing our final hymn together. Uh, in English, the title is O oh, to See the Dawn. Um, but this time we're going to hear the hymn in Welsh. Aled uh, has put it together in Welsh for us. Uh, but the English words will come up for those of you who don't speak Welsh. Let's sing together.
Byddai dyr arglwydd dy fendithio a thgadw, byddai dyr arglwydd lewyrchu ei wyneb arnat a bod yn drigarog wrthyt, byddai dyr arglwydd edrych arnat a rhoi i ti heddwch. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.